Okay, welcome everybody. I'm, if you expect the biology talk, you're going to be very uh, disappointed here. As Yindra was uh, indicating, I'm going to talk about what we think is a new form of engaging uh, arts and science. Um, instead of trying to combine the two to do artistic research or uh, to, to use art to convey science, what we're trying to do is something new called that. Uh, um, uh, William Irwin Thompson called Wissenskunst. And I'm going to introduce that concept. And this is all part of a, an exciting new uh, art project that I'm a part of. It's called The Zone, uh, based in Vienna with uh, a collaboration with artist Bronwyn Lays and Marcus Neustetter and curator Basak Senova that I'm involved in. So I should also say that um, the organizers um, invited me to give a completely different talk. So I, I, I'm sorry for that, but I hope this will also be interesting and on topic for this, this wonderful conference that you're organizing there. So what is this all about? I want to start the talk uh, with this wonderful etching by William Blake, the polymath poet and artist, and it's called The Reunion of the Soul and the Body. You can see that what I think uh, is, is the man on the ground is representing the body and the woman that comes from the, the, the skies, from the heavens, is the soul and they're um, engaged in this wild embrace, while around them the world, which is represented by a graveyard, as far as I can see, and there's an open grave in the foreground, is going up in flames. And I think that's a very sort of uh, impressive impression of what uh, the world looks like today. And uh, I chose this picture because it's on the cover of a wonderfully weird book by this man that I've already mentioned, William Irvin Thompson, a very eclectic scholar. Um, the book is called The Time Falling Bodies Take to Light. It, it, is a, it is a wide ranging ramble about mythology, sexuality, and the origins of culture. I have to disappoint you, I'm not gonna talk about sex today, so just about mythology. Um, but uh, this book is, is, is unique. It's what you could call psychoactive literature. You read it and you become a different person. It's also, it's weird, it's a bit too esoteric for my taste sometimes, but it's full of, of sort of really strange ideas that give you a grip on, on our current, you know, human condition. And the, the central thesis of this book is, is captured by this sentence on the slide here. Myth is the history of the soul. What on earth does that mean? So the rest of my talk is basically just sort of trying to parse this statement. Okay, so what, what um, William Irwin Thompson is doing in this book, he's saying um, the basic problem that we have in current society is that we have lost our soul. And this is not a religious text. So what does he mean by soul? He doesn't mean some sort of immortal essence that you have. Um, instead, what he means is that we have lost the narrative that we tell about ourselves. And I want to sort of contextualize that first by listing three different orders that you can, that you need to make sense of the world. And this is based on work by a uh, cognitive psychologist and philosopher John Verveke, who has this absolutely amazing series of lectures on YouTube called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. I really heavily recommend that. He's also written a book about zombies. We'll come back to that in a minute. And in that book about zombies, he first postulates he and his co-authors first postulate um, uh, these three orders that you need for sense-making. The first one is that narrative order that I was just talking about. It's basically the story you tell about your own experiences and how you contextualize that in the world. Okay, and it's, it's coming first because it's a first-person perspective. It could be from the first-person perspective of an individual, or it could be from the first person perspective of a, a whole community, a society. The second order that you need is a normative order. That's basically our ethics, the way we treat each other, the way we co-develop our societies. That's a second person perspective. And the third person perspective is called the nomological order. Nomological means law-like, and this means the, the sort of scientific uh, insights into nature. And what both Thompson and Verveke are saying is that 
So you cannot only have science to make sense of the world. That's just number three. You need to have the right ethics, but you need to also have the right narrative about yourself, the first person perspective that places you in the world. Now, the problem is that all three orders are currently uh, in trouble. The nomological order, science is attacked from left and right, you know, by people, very postmodern relative people. We live in a post-truth world, right? Um, the second order, the, the normative order is, is breaking down. We're losing social cohesion uh, in modern societies. But the worst effect that clearly is this narrative order. We've completely lost it. We've lost the ability to tell stories about ourselves. And this is an exploration. Um, I think this is where arts and science can step in and where this, this strange concept of Wissenskunst um, comes in. Okay, so what is this sort of narrative that we've lost? What was the old sort of mythology? Remember, uh, Thompson talks about myth, narrative order. The myths that we're, we're telling about ourselves are the stories that, that sort of make sense of our place in the world. So the, the, the sort of old myth that we had can be summarized with Plato's, the, the, the two world mythology of Plato's cave. Let me explain that very briefly. So I kind of assume that everybody has heard of the parable of the cave uh, published in Plato's Republic, book number seven. And uh, it is a very powerful, powerful story, not just about what the world is like, but what it means to come to understand the world. So you probably know the basic outline. Uh, it describes people as being shackled to the wall in, in the cave. We have the, in the back is, is an opening where light shines in and you have these, these um, forms that pass in front of that opening, casting shadows on the opposite wall. So all the people in the cave can see are the shadows on the wall. And since this is the entirety, the totality of their experience, they think that these shadows are the world. But then, of course, uh, Plato has a philosopher figure, and she uh, gets out of the cave, you know, breaks away from the chains, and climbs up on the, the right-hand side of this picture here uh, towards the, the, uh, the landscape that is outside the cave. And uh, when she arrives at the top, she sees the world, the real world, with completely different eyes. And this real world for Plato is a world of perfect forms, ideal forms, which you have to understand as sort of organizing principles behind the phenomena, the shadows in the, war, in the cave. Okay, so these are the, the, the really truly deep insights that you get into the world. It's not that this is, in Plato's philosophy, a completely different world up there. But what's really important here and what people don't stress enough when they tell this story is the journey from the cave to the uh, world outside. And that is central in Plato's telling because what needs to happen on the way out of the cave is that you basically transform yourself. You have to become a different person. You have to complexify your view of the world. And you also have to decenter. Um, your position, your stance. You have to go from a child that is very egocentric. Some people never escape that phase to someone who is omnicentric, who sees the whole of reality the way it really is. Otherwise, um, if you don't go through these transformations, you end up, um, excuse me, you end up uh, on top and blinded by the sunlight and you, you cannot see anything. You cannot recognize the world as it, as it is on the surface. So this is very important. It's a transformative journey that is called anagogy in ancient Greek. Uh, this simply means climb or ascent, but uh, it, it, it's very important that this, you, you will be a different person. And actually Plato um, summarizes, he shows this in his story because the philosopher, she goes back into the cave and she tells the others what she saw up on the surface and nobody understands because they haven't undergone these transformations. So you basically have to become a different person uh, to see the world differently, different framings to understand what's going on. And she's completely alienated. And the only way to get the other people to, to understand is to, to send them on their own journeys, of course. 
So this is a very, very powerful narrative, okay, about how the world is really like and how you can get to know it in a better way. And this is, of course, uh, Plato wrote this story to counter the old myths of gods and heroes, but what he did is he created a, basically a new mythology, this two-world mythology of the world above and the world below. And this was taken up by the Neoplatonists later and then uh, most powerfully by the Christian church who turned this realm of ideal forms into the spiritual realm of God. And you could no longer get there by reasoning, but you had to be called there by faith. So this is a completely detached transcendental world on top of the other one. Much later, Immanuel Kant uh, produced a secular version of the same thing when he divided reality into the, the world of appearances, of phenomena, which are basically the shadows in the cave, and the, the real world of noumena, the, the sting and sich uh, that corresponds to the ideal, the world of ideal forms in Plato, which you can never reach as a sort of a limited human knower. This, this is very powerful stuff, okay? It gives you a framework that tells you why the world is not perfect, why it doesn't make sense sometimes, and it gives you instructions on how uh, to uh, reach a deeper understanding of what the world is really like. But the problem is that this sort of mythology, this narrative order that we had for 2,400 years almost, uh, is not in good shape today. And here's the guy who basically killed it with the help of a few others such as Hegel and Auguste Comte and many others in the 20th century. Um, so when Nietzsche declared in the 19th century that God is dead and we have killed him, this is often misunderstood as some sort of call to arms for atheists, but it's not that. It's basically a warning that our old narrative is no longer relevant for an increasing amount of people and that it no longer helps us to make sense of the world. And Nietzsche was basically the prophet of the meaning crisis of today. He was predicting that we would uh, slide into an age of nihilism, and he is not a nihilist philosopher. He was warning us that this would happen. So Nietzsche destroys this idea of, of Plato's world of ideal forms, and at the same time, in one of the best and most dense passages in uh, any philosophical writing, one page in the Twilight of the Idols called The History of an Error, he also destroys Kant's idea of, a, of the world of noumena, the ding an sich. It just doesn't exist. And when he's done with all of that, there is only a smoking heap of rubble. This burning world is left that you see in, in Blake's uh, picture right at the beginning. So we have a problem. Okay, we have lost our narrative order and we need some kind of new mythos. And so now we have to think about it. Uh, how can we get uh, a new mythology that is, is, is contemporary? It cannot be religious because God is dead. God is irrelevant for an increasing number of people. So how can we come up with a narrative that places us in the world again and lets us have a grip on reality, the grip that we're currently losing? So in principle, so, so what we have to ask is who are the people who are responsible to create this new mythology? It's not clear initially, right? And Thompson has a lot to say about that in his book. So what he says, let, so let's consider the scientists first. Are the scientists the ones that will come up with this new narrative order? And what Thompson writes, and I'm give, gonna give you a few quotes that I'm just gonna read to you because they're so wonderful. He writes, the history of the soul is obliterated. Remember, that's metaphorical for the loss of the narrative order. The universe is shut out, and on the walls of Plato's cave, the experts in the casting of shadows tell the story of man's rise from ignorance to science through the power of technology. So he doesn't think that you can trust the scientists to come up with a new mythos. The scientists are simply experts in the casting of shadows in the cave. Now, I've heard that there are a lot of artists in the audience here. So if, if you're now gleeful about the scientists and you're happy that they get a really bad rap, wait till the next slide. So this uh, is Thompson on art. He writes, in the classical era, the person who saw history in the light of myth was the prophet, an Isaiah or Jeremiah. 
In the modern era, the person who saw history in the light of myth was the artist, a Blake or a Yeats. But now in our postmodern era, the artists have become a degenerate priesthood. They have become not spirits of liberation, but the interior decorators of Plato's cave. We cannot look for them, to them for revolutionary deliverance. Pretty harsh. So he says the artists are the interior decorators of Plato's cave. So we can't get a narrative order from the, the scientists. We can't get a narrative order from the artists. What the hell is going on? What are we going to do? And this is where this, this, this concept comes in, which he calls Wissenskunst. And he writes, the revisioning of history is also an act of prophecy. He writes very metaphorically, right? This is not religious prophecy, not prophecy in the sense of making predictions for the universe is too free and open-ended for the manipulations of a religious egotism, but prophecy in the sense of seeing history in the light of myth. We need a new narrative. That's what myths are. If history becomes the medium of our imprisonment, then history must become the medium of our liberation. To rise, we must push against the ground to which we have fallen. For this radical task, the boundaries of both art and science must be redrawn. Wissenschaft must become Wissenkunst. And this is where I cringe as a German speaker, because obviously as an American, Thompson gets his inflections wrong here, and that's a bad thing. So it's Wissenskunst, not Wissenkunst. So this is what we wanna do in our arts and science project. We want to engage in the art of the Wissenskunst of myth-making, of creating a new narrative order. And uh, it's a very ambitious task. So to understand what that means, we have to look a bit closer at what I mean by myth, okay? Because this term has very different, sometimes negative connotations. And uh, Thompson writes in a, in a sort of an age of chaos, like that one that we're in right now, uh, myth is often seen as a false statement, an opinion popularly held, but one known by scientists and other experts to be incorrect. This is not what is meant by myth here. And I'll give you John Verveke's version of a better definition, which is myths are ways in which we express and by which we try to come into right relationship the patterns that are relevant to us, either because they are perennial or because they are pressing. Okay, the really fundamental problems. It's a story we tell ourselves to get a grip on that reality that we're in. Without myths, we cannot make sense of these patterns. And that's what Thompson means by becoming soulless. That is the source of what Verveke is talking about when he talks about a meaning crisis in society today. So how do we cure this problem? Well, before I come to that, let's examine the, the quintessential modern myth. In fact, um, French philosophers, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari said, this is the only modern myth there is. And that's the myth of zombies. As I said, Verveke has written a whole book about zombies. And you may think, what the hell does that have to do with narrative order? But if you think about it, this whole flurry of TV series and uh, films that came out in the early 2000s with zombies in them, they are a symptom of modern society. The zombie is simply a, a symbol for the loss of meaning. Zombies live in herds, but they don't talk to each other. They're, they're homeless, they just walk around and they are in search, constant search of, of food. They're unlovable, untouchable, they're ugly. And ironically, what they eat is brains. They are neither alive or dead, but they destroy the brains of others, literally devouring meaning. They destroy meaning, okay? So they're a very powerful symbol of what's happening to us in this modern day. We cannot make sense of the world anymore. The zombie can't make sense either. And zombie movies rarely have a happy ending. And this is the big problem, right? The loss of meaning is rampant, ubiquitous, and terminal. So if you compare this to, to Plato's myth of the cave, there is no way out of the zombie myth. It expresses our problem, but it doesn't help us escape or solve it. And that's not a good thing. 
remember the main thing about Plato's cave is that it allows you to get out of the cave. It shows you how to do that. Anagogy is what you need to do to make sense of the world. But the zombie myth is empty. It, there's no way out. And therefore, it is a failed myth. So we need better myths. And Wissenskunst is exactly that. It's the making of new mythologies for our modern age. So how do you start that? There's a very good book by Philip Ball about modern myths. And what he points out is that you cannot just sit down and write a myth. You know, myths are created accidentally. So myths are picked up, stories that are picked up by others, and they mutate and evolve, and they inspire other people. So this whole sort of evolutionary genealogy of myths, of, of stories, becomes a mother myth. But you cannot just write down uh, a myth and, and postulate the myth. So if we want to play with a new myth mythology, we have to do it in an indirect way. And what we are trying to do uh, is very difficult, OK? We cannot do it on purpose. So all we can do is, is create the conditions for it to thrive. And the best way to go about this is to really try and understand what is the process by which we, we can make sense of the world, OK? We have lost uh, Plato's ideal domain. How can we go inside us, examine our relationship with the world, and create a new narrative order from that? And for that, we must understand one problem, and that is how do we pick out relevant factors from our environment? This process is called, it's a problem of relevance, and the process by which you pick out facts that are important is called relevance realization. So it's a bit like, where is Wally or where is Waldo for our friends in the US? Um, you see this picture with lots of impressions. There's tons of people on the beach and you're overwhelmed by a gazillion of impressions. And out of those, you need to pick out the one relevant fact, which is Wally, where is he? You know, and that's a process that is, is something that we don't understand very well how this happened. So let's examine it a little bit more closely. So relevance realization is a very fundamental process of our existence. It reaches into the depth of our experiences. It arises at the first moments of our existence. Little babies and animals can do relevance realization. So you can do this before you can think logically. And that means it's a process that occurs below the level of our propositional uh, uh, knowledge, below the level of logic, of representation, and all that. But it also reaches in, into the highest realms of our cognition. You can basically see consciousness as a higher order recursive relevance realization, reordering our impressions to make sense of the world. So consciousness probably evolved to be this uh, super powered uh, relevance realization process out of which we can make sense in really complicated situations. But you have to realize that you, you cannot have an algorithm that does this. You cannot have an algorithm that finds relevant because the number of possibly relevant impressions from the, the environment is indefinite. It's, it's not clear how many there are and possibly infinite. So uh, that's one problem. The other problem is that the number of possibly, uh, well, that's what I just said. The, the, the other problem is that the, the category of what we find relevant does not have any essential properties. What do I mean by that? What is relevant depends radically on the situation and it will change from situation to situation. So basically, you cannot just sit down and say, okay, what is relevant in my life is this and this and this. You cannot make a list, uh, a finite list of relevant uh, properties. And that's what you need to uh, formulate an algorithm. So that there is no algorithm for relevance realization. And in that way, it's very similar to evolution. This is why my talk is subtitled, um, playing with evolutionary ideas. Think about adaptation in evolution. Just like relevance, there is no essential property of that which is adapted, yeah? So we must constantly adapt to pick out relevant features of new situations. And that's exactly similar to the category of what we find relevant, okay? So these, these properties, they're not essential properties. This, this is radically context dependent. So we have to have uh, this constant ongoing process, an evolutionary kind of process that makes sense of the world. And it involves not just one uh, process, but it's full of, of sub processes that interact. And I wanna 
represent this with this beautiful drawing by Gemma Anderson, also for the reason that this is the project that uh, Indra actually asked me to present. Uh, and uh, it's published already in the journal Leonardo. You can see the reference down here. It's a, a, a study of how to use drawing to understand movements, dynamics in biological systems. And these dynamics, they consist just like the dynamic process of relevance realization of all these different uh, processes that work together and also against each other very often um, to make uh, the whole process, all in all, overall uh, process of processes adaptive, okay? This is called opponent processing. So you have different processes that basically struggle against each other to help, me, help you make sense of the world. And I'm almost done. So just to sum everything up, basically, let's bring it back to Plato's idea of anagogy. We want to reformulate this journey, this transformative journey that now no longer goes outside the cave, but it goes inside ourselves and our relationship to the world. It goes to this process of relevance realization and a new mythology that is scientifically based, not religious, needs to be based on that process. Transformative learning, anagogy, is nothing but a realignment of our relevance realization processes to get a better grip on our situation, on our reality. And we can train this process through practice, but we cannot simply step outside it and understand it objectively because we cannot make sense of it as we make sense through it. Okay, so, so you cannot make any sense without this process. So you cannot just uh, look at it objectively. You always think through it. And the only way you can engage with something like this is through play. So if you cannot just sit down and understand it, you need to play with it to get a feeling for it, to build intuitions on how it works, okay? And so this is what we mean by serious play. Serious play is a technique that allows you to overcome existential entrapment. This sounds very nice. So basically what ha what, what's happening right now is we're stuck. We have no narrative order. We need to get out of this, but we cannot just step out of this process. So to get unstuck, we must start playing. And this is very serious because it's, it's deeply existential, right? And I'm gonna give you a quote of uh, this guy who's actually not a real person. Hansi Freinach is a political philosopher who's actually a construct. Um, and there are two very smart Scandinavian philosophers and sociologists behind him. He has formulated a meta-modern um, philosophy of politics. And you should read his two books the Listening Society and the Nordic Ideology, if you're really interested in how we can get out of our current crises. And in this book, serious play is very, very important. What it means to take the, the definition of Hansi here is to assume a genuinely playful stance towards life and existence, a playfulness that demands of us the gravest seriousness given the ever-present potentials for unimaginable suffering and bliss. This is what we want to do in the zone. We've started uh, putting content online. You can see the website here. And I do want to acknowledge very much uh, the, the people whose work this philosophical foundation for the project is based on. William Irwin Thompson, John Urveke, and Hansi Freina. Uh, and I would like to, to once again acknowledge my artistic collaborators, Bronwyn Lace, Marcus Neustetter, and Bashak Senova. And with that, I will stop show you a movie here and take your questions. If there are any questions. Can you hear me over there, Jinder? I can't hear you if you're if you're saying anything. Can you hear me? Actually. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, I just I just didn't want to interrupt the the movie. Uh, oh, this is just running in the background. You can find it on the website, okay. and it's going to go on for another five minutes. So okay. I just wanted to run it in the background while we have question okay. and answer. Sorry okay. for that. Perfect. Should have said that. So, uh, Yogi, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to ask if there are any questions from the public. Adam Hess. 
Yeah, I would like to ask, uh, what's your, um, uh, do you know Andreas Weber, this uh, German? Yes, yes. yes, yes. It reminds me very much of of, uh, of Andreas Weber in a way, uh, in a certain way to, to kind of uh, rebuild this, uh, uh, I'd say like this religion's touch to our existence. No, no I wouldn't say, um, I don't, I don't know if the mythical maybe is the right word as you as you put it no but uh i i i i see that you use much more of the uh scientific language to really depict the and uh algorithms and also all these mechanisms that could lead potentially to that um do do you really uh, how uh, and, and to, uh and to which extent do you really like uh extend into the arts or how, what is your uh, uh, opinion about like arts and science? <laughs> okay, so right. this was just the, the, the philosophical foundation for what we're actually doing. So uh, the, the movie that's playing in the background is, is actually uh, an example of what we're doing. So we're playing here, we're engaged in serious play, but we're um, also, if you had the sound on, you would hear that uh, I'm reciting quotes from a from a wonderful book by James Cars. It's called um, uh, Finite and Infinite Games, and uh, it's about an extension of this idea of serious play. That you know we're engaged in all these finite games uh, that we play. We apply for jobs. You know we have to compete against each other. A finite game is something that you can win or lose. It has specific rules. It has a beginning and an end. And an infinite game is something where you just play to stay uh, in the game, to keep on playing, right? And you can think of um, evolution as an infinite game. And of course, research, the, the sort of the whole process of doing research itself is an infinite game. And it helps you reframe uh, your position. So, so what we're doing is we're, we're basically doing, Wissenskunst is a kind of a theory art. So we're trying to play with ideas that are ser it's serious play. So the ideas that we're playing with are serious. We're not coming up with nonsensical philosophical ideas, but we're taking important philosophical concepts and we're trying to, to play with them artistically. And uh, to just list a few other examples of what we've done, uh, you, can, you can check the website, but there's, there's a sort of a, a, a playful examination of, for example, uh, Kafka's narrative of, of uh, the metamorphosis, which is very apropos for a, for a meeting in Prague uh, from someone speaking from Vienna. So that's one of our projects. And then we have others. Uh, and, and one big project is that we've created a, a virtual reality landscape of uh, Plato's cave. And we're exploring the kind of concepts, the philosophical concepts that I've introduced here through performances in this virtual reality space. And you can see two examples of, of videos. Actually, one is just being uploaded this weekend. It's just waiting for me to write the brief description. The first one is already uh, online. And you can see examples of these sort of artistic, uh, we have performance lectures and we have uh, artistic inter interventions. Um, we've been offline, uh, uh, online very much with the COVID um, situation the last two years, but we also want to get offline now and, and do these interventions in, in real locations and in, in the real world. Um, so it's, it's a thoroughly artistic project, but it's also serious in its philosophy. So it is. It is. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to see how uh, you Im, uh, implement the element of, of play and art in uh, in science. Actually, this is quite rare, maybe, to do such a use it as a tool for um, understanding. Yeah, but I think it was very common, but we've we've lost it, right? I mean, this is one of the things we've completely lost. Is 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 in all the competition. It's such a fierce competition in art and in science that. It's basically become this sort of me, 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 you know? Uh, there's this wonderful um, science fiction book, The Sirens of Titan by Kurt Vonnegut, where, where, you know, I mean, I hope I don't spoil the thing too much by telling you that in the end, there's an alien that sends a message and they're trying to, to um, decode it. And in the end, it's just like, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And so the, the whole of, of um, art and science is increasingly becoming a game of, of you know, uh, just self-presentation, basically. Um, the movie is now done, so I'm just going to put, um, if I can do that, uh, the slide with the website up again. Maybe it's a so, result of, of this, of this uh, kind of show business um, aspect to both science and... I think the root cause is this cult of productivity that we have, that, you know, as an artist and as a scientist, and, uh, you know, to be competitive, you have to produce, 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 and 
everything is accelerating and it's just crazy. So, so in, reintroducing the, the, the element of play means breaking out of this, this craziness um, so that we can actually break out of the cave again. Um, we've, we've completely stuck ourselves in the cave through this uh, uh, late, you know, it's a late capitalist system where we think uh, market ideas and ideas of productivity can be applied to anything in society. And it's just a thoroughly stupid and uh, destructive philosophy, in our opinion. Well, uh, so, so um, I have, uh, well, one, one is more a comment than a question, uh, but maybe it's a question. So one thing is that uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if I get what, what you were talking right. I, I need to absorb it. But uh, one thing is that, uh, for example, this uh, loss of narrative is something that maybe happens in uh, current computer games that uh, are basically uh, focused on, on selling, but they just uh, stop to uh, think out of the box and about uh, what they want to really bring to the player the experience and they just focus on to be technologically detailed and and advanced but they don't uh, but actually what they lose is is the story in 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 the game or it's also in the in the in the mainstream um, movie cinemas that you can see it's full of technology but there is no story and it, actually you don't like the movie anymore because it, it, it's not it's not telling you anything except the visual, even though uh, pretty awesome, but still uh, it's lacking some basis. Uh, is, is, is this uh, something to uh, compare uh, this situation in real world or uh, uh, losing a, a, a narrative in, in, in real world? Is it something like this? Absolutely, I think it's, uh... It's sim these are all symptoms. I mean, the other thing you can look at and where it's most blatant is the, the way we design uh, uh, AI in, for example, social media, right? I mean, so if you, if you go to Facebook, it's not actually designed for you to make friends and, and have a community. It's designed for the people who ad advertise to, to get your attention. So um, Jaron Lanier has, has compared this to, you know, it's, it's the, the best kind of local park for children that you could imagine in your city. And it's designed by the crack dealers that are dealing drugs in the park, right? So this is this can only happen in a world where we have com completely lost uh, our aim, right? So this is what Thompson means by lost, losing our soul. We have lost the storyline completely, and we are losing ourselves in in this kind of world. And uh, all all of what you were uh, listing is is is, is again is a, is a a sort of a loss of coherence if you think about it all over in all kinds of areas of society, we are losing coherence uh, socially, we are losing coherence mentally. Um, and that's why you see also it's connected to everything because you see such high levels of anxiety and depression because people are losing the plot quite literally. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this um, palpable. You know, we, 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 I could just hold philosophical talks about this, but we want to make this an experience that you can actually feel it, you know? And there's a wonderful article that I really recommend uh, by uh, Jonathan Rosen online, which is called Tasting the Pickle. And it talks about the meaning crisis and the, all these crises that we have today, ecological crisis, political ones. And it says, we, we not only have to understand them cerebrally in our heads, we have to, you know, the point of this title, Tasting the Pickle is, you have to really uh, experience the crisis. And uh, these are very complex problems that we're dealing with. Um, you could call them hyper objects like climate change. This is Timothy Morton's concept. Um, they're so complex problems that we can't grasp them easily. So the narrative would, would allow you again to, to grasp them really, you know, intuitively. And so we have to have stories that, that grasp people's attentions. So they actually act upon the knowledge of all these problems. Because if you just have these, these abstract problems, you, you're incapable of acting on them in, in the complex society that we live in. We don't know what, how to act in the right way anymore. Um, so what you were saying are perfectly good examples for what we're talking about, but it, it sort of affects everything today, I think, really. I mean, everything. Yeah, well, uh, one thing, uh, 
about the myth, maybe uh, uh, the the populism. You are also a little bit touching it. Uh, they they actually uh, prosper from myth building that we don't understand that actually they are they are building myth because uh, uh, the 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 reality around us is not perfectly clear, but based on some uh, some perceived historical uh, historical events, uh, these uh, the, the populist uh, movements can build up a story that uh, actually fits some uh, some parts of the population, and then that way they they actually become detached from the reality. But for, for them, this is the reality. This is their myth they are living. And, and maybe what, what you are talking about is that what we need is to start to build a, like a myth that, that, would be, that would be really helpful for, that would be general and would be helpful to live together, not like to distinguish between uh, different groups based on their differential perception of reality, Some, something like this. Yeah, so you're using, uh, you're contrasting now the populist myth is the myth that has been, the story that has been proven scientifically wrong, right? And the other myth, the myth that we're trying to create is a myth that's actually, um, it's not scientific, but it, it, it sticks, you know, it's, it's coherent with scientific, the, the, the nomological order. And it also uh, is a, something that actively helps you get a grip on reality. The, the, the purpose of these false myths bullshit myths of the, the populists is to for you to lose your grip. They profit from you losing your grip on reality. And so this kind of thing, if you have very strong narratives that actually help you get a grip on reality, populism cannot thrive in a society like that because people are not easily losing um, their sense of reality. And this is what, I mean, uh, a, a whole lot of our societies are completely delusional, you know, as we know from experience you know, recent experience in, in both of our countries. So, you know, this is the opposite of what we're trying to do here. I, I want to make this very clear. So the kind of myths we're trying to create are those that are gonna be helpful in getting a better grip on reality, not to sort of play and bullshit, you know, play with people and bullshit them. Right, it, it, is, it is something like a, like a, uh psychotherapy for the society uh like to uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> okay uh jana Schwarzova is asking in the chat uh greetings mm -hmm. yogi this is maybe a bit far from your lecture but maybe not i'm wondering a lot about crispr cas methods methods how we modify artificially our genome in a sense uh, that they are the culmination of this technocratic approach we have uh, towards nature and that we believe that nature is predictable mechanism of some kind. I would be curious about your opinion on germline editing, whether you think uh, it is dangerous. <laughs> so this is, uh, everything's connected in my mind to this this project. So that's, uh, <laughs> thank you, Jana. And um, yes, I am working on your book chapter, but these guys just, you know, the, they distracted me. I've, I've put too much work into this talk. It was too much fun to do that. Okay, so CRISPR technology in general is, so again, we're, you know, pushing ahead with technologies very quickly. And there is a widespread belief that goes back to the modernist worldview of the 20th century that we can fix all our problems with, with technology. But in fact, this kind of ever accelerating technological advances without any uh, advances in, in personal and, you know, societal co-development um, that we get a more mature as people and as societies is, is a tremendously dangerous development. And uh, there is an, an interesting philosopher, uh, uh, Daniel Schmackenberger, who says that this is actually a self-terminating dynamic, basically. We are sure to, to dis destroy ourselves if our, our wisdom cannot you know, keep track of uh, the technological development. So you can think of this in the, the three orders that I, I showed you that, you know, uh, the, the technologies are a product of this nomological order. So basically there's an imbalance of how we develop further these three orders, right? And so we are pushing at the moment, everything into this nomological order. We, we think that if we get a better science, then we will get out of the problems that we have. We will solve ecological breakdown and, and climate change and societal breakdown and everything. But 
the point that people like John Ravecki and Schmackenberger are, are making is that you have to, at the same time, and this is what Hansi Freinach's um, philosophy is all about, is that you have at the same time, you have to develop your ethics, you have to develop your own narrative, your own story. So um, CRISPR-Cas9 in particular is, is a massively uh, potentially dangerous technology that uh, can only be handled by a mature society because its destructive potential is, is unheard of. And also it intervenes in very complex systems. Uh, we have no idea what kind of unintended consequences the, the release of this technology will have basically. And if we do not grow up to become a more mature species and, and apply uh, the cautionary principle very widely with these technologies, we are almost certain to create some major, major disasters and problems uh, with the release of uh, such technologies. But, but mind you, of course, uh, um, genome engineering is not the only technology, uh, nanotechnology, you know, nuclear technology, bio uh, uh, research, gain of function research in viruses, all these kind of things are technologies that are tremendously powerful and are not accompanied by um, the corresponding advances in uh, the organization and, and, you know, the growth of maturity uh, in, in individuals and in society is a huge problem.